Welcome, and thank you for uh, your attendance. If, you, if I talk without the amplification, can you hear me in the back? Okay, great. I'd rather do it this way. So, one of the standard assumptions about the internet and related communication technology is that they facilitate unprecedented opportunities for intercultural exchange and dialogue. Although early versions of this were already evident in circulation with the technology of telegraphy, radio, and television, it's only recently that this concept appears to have achieved some widespread acceptance and almost unquestioned saturation in the current situation. And you can see evidence of this in the marketing campaigns of uh, you know, equipment manufacturers and service providers. You can see it in the popular media and press, and you also see it in a lot of academic writing about technology, um, especially uh, information and communication technology. Now, the assumption is undeniably powerful, and it's persuasive precisely because it supplies a technological solution to the difficulties and challenges of intercultural communication. And as educators interested in intercultural education and involved with international students, we want to know whether this assumption is in fact true. In other words, we wanted to test this widespread assumption about the impact of digital technology on the international experience. So in other words, we wanted to know whether information and communication technology, or ICT, makes a difference in bridging cultural difference and negotiating the international experience. In particular, we wanted to know whether and to what extent recent innovations in digital technology provide assistance to international students in their efforts to live, work, and study abroad. Now, in order to address these questions, we designed and executed a qualitative study of international students, which we call, and here's our title, Negotiating Cultural Difference in the Digital Communication Era. <laughs> the project was funded by a generous grant from the Harmonia II project of Narodowe Centrum Nauki, the Polish uh, National Science Center. And our international project team consisted of five researchers, three located at the Jagiellonian University in Krakow, Poland, and the two other from US ins institutions, Northern Illinois University and Columbia College. The hypothesis that was guiding our investigation was that transformations in the global sphere of communication have a significant impact on the possibilities, perspectives, and character of intercultural encounters. In order to test the hypothesis, we conducted interviews with international students studying at institutions in places in Poland and in the US. The interviews were designed to supply qualitative data concerning the international experience and the impact of technology on student success in dealing with cultural difference and study abroad experience. The objective of the investigation was to supply data that could either refute or could confirm the hypothesis by providing detailed insight into the uses and gratifications of digital technology by international students in the 21st century, what internet researchers now call, following a kind of marketing campaign, digital natives. Previous work in this area include a number of recent quantitative studies. Among these, the most notable are the preliminary examination of international students' adjustment and loneliness related to electronic communication, which was published in Psychological Reports. Another paper called Cyber Communication, a New Opportunity for International Students' Adaptation, published in the International Journal of Intercultural Relations. And lastly, a paper by Yin Kong called Acculturation in the Age of New Media, which was a paper presented at the 2005 International, Associ uh, International Communications Association. These studies, unlike our study, all used quantitative surveys to investigate how international students interacted with uh, new technology. And in varying degrees, they all offer support for the claim that information and communication technology provides these international students with easy access to their home country. And that this contact may, and I underline the word may, facilitate better ad adaptation to life in the host country. None of the studies have any real definitive data. They sort of you know, tilt in that direction, but they don't really give anything uh, highly definitive with regards to that. What makes our project distinctive is really two things. One is, instead of using quantitative methods, we decided to go with qualitative methods, namely in-depth interviews with international students. Unlike the quantitative survey data and investigations, interviews are often able to discover 
not just types of behavior, but motivations, gratifications, and rationale behind behavior. In other words, you can sort of get behind the uh, phenomenon of the behavior to see why it is the way it is. Although qualitative studies have their own challenges, and I'll get to those in a second, they can supply things you cannot get with quantitative kinds of research. And we were hoping to at least get a peek into that uh, aspect of uh, student behavior. The second unique part of our study is the scope of the project. All the previous studies looked at the way that international students used this technology to maintain contact with their home country and therefore abate loneliness or homesickness. We were also interested in the way they used it to contact people in the host country. In other words, how did they use the technology not just to contact home, but how did they use the technology in the host country to navigate linguistic difference, cultural difference, um, differences having to do with relationships, etc. So for our purposes then, we're looking really at a bigger uh, picture, we hope, and that our results uh, bear this out. Although the interviews were guided by a formal uh, questionnaire, we did make adequate opportunities for researchers to follow up and get in-depth responses from uh, interviewees when those opportunities presented themselves. And the interviews were conducted here at the Agalonian University um, by Agnieszka and by Gary, and then at Northern Illinois University by myself. And these were all done in the spring of 2013. Each of the interviews was audio recorded and then transcribed with the private information of the interviewee stripped off to protect privacy and to accord uh, with IRB requirements, etc. Participants for the interviews were recruited following IRB guidelines through self-selection, facilitated by posting notifications in uh, offices and facilities frequented by international students at the host institutions, and through general broadcast email messages sent to lists of students who were uh, noted as visiting scholars or on grants or scholarship uh, in the host country. The qualifications for participation were absolutely simple. Undergraduate or graduate students studying at this, you know, at, at a different institution from their home institution. So very simple. We ended up interviewing 18 individuals from nine different countries, and we had at least one representative from each continent except Antarctica. So you know, no penguins were involved in this project. Because participation was voluntary, we did not control for gender. And as a result of this, our sample was, for better or worse, skewed in the direction of a higher population of male subjects. The age of our interview subjects ranged from 21 to 36, making the average age 25.6 years of age. And over half the participants listed English as their native language. But all the English-speaking participants were studying at a Polish institution, and the only Polish student was studying at a US institution. So everyone was working and living outside their native language, however that was formed. In terms of ICT usage, Facebook and Skype comprised the most often used applications, with Facebook utilized by all but one participant. Other applications, the 7% you see there, include email, QQ, which is a Chinese emulation of uh, Facebook, I learned, um, uh, Contactor, which is a Russian version of the same, and Tumblr, all of which were used by only one participant um, accordingly. The main reason for ICT usage was maintaining contact with friends and family. The majority of these interactions were reported as being with friends and family back home, but just under half of the participants indicated that they used ICT to maintain, to maintain contact with friends they have made in the host country. So there was you know, significant uh, information with regards to how they use this information, not only to uh, communicate back home to friends and family, but also how they were using it here to contact people in the host country. In terms of level of usage, which was defined by actively posting data, adding friends, sharing images, etc. This was rated by most participants as being high, and increase in usage was reported uh, by more than half of our interview subjects, so that they were using it more, or at least they told us they were using it more, once they started uh, living and studying abroad. Because we collected qualitative information from interviews, the resulting data set, as you can imagine, is large and complex. 
Nevertheless, a few common elements and trends have emerged related to our main research topic and hypothesis. First off, attitudes towards technology cover the spectrum with neutral counting for just less than half of the responses and positive and negative equally divided among the remainder. Reasons offered for a neutral attitude conform to the instrumentalist definition of technology. That is this notion that technology is just a tool and it really means nothing. I just use it to contact people. End of story. Positive comments celebrated the easy access to information that the technology affords connection with friends, and the ability to engage in intercultural communication. And by comparison, negative responses criticized the effect of mediated communication on real social skills and the perceived lack of profound connection attributed to what our participants called real social interactions. And those are their words. In response to the question, does digital media help with intercultural communication, the majority of our participants answered yes. That's nine out of 14. Four answered with a negative response, and one participant declined to give his or her opinion. The most common reason for positive responses had to do with language. Many of the participants reported that they found online tools like Google Translate and language tutorials on YouTube to be indispensable to helping them navigate a new language or a language they barely knew. Negative responses came from two participants who thought ICTs were only useful for maintaining contact with friends back home, one respondent that preferred face-to-face -face communication in all circumstances, and then another respondent, which had this amazing response in which he said, I really don't care about the culture of the host country. I don't want to learn anything about it. I didn't ask about the anger, but you know, there you go. In response to the question, can you imagine living abroad prior to the internet, the majority of our participants, again, eight out of 14 in this case, answered positively, with the remaining six responding no to this particular question. The majority of those that responded in the positive recognized the difficulty of living, with, living abroad without the conveniences of the internet, but reported that they probably would be able to figure things out. They would find other ways of coping. At the extreme end, one respondent even voiced a neo-Ludite desire for a world without the internet, saying that a world without the internet would be paradise. I would love to live, live in that world. Those that responded in the negative had reasons that extended from Complete dismay. How could people live this way? How could you ever live without the internet? How could people ever travel without the internet? Just this absolute dismay of living outside this digital enclosure to just you know marginal concerns about the conveniences and the speed of digital communication being better than letters or even telephone calls. So in conclusion, we can say the generalizable data does lend support to the initial hypothesis. For the majority of participants in our study, information and communication technology is perceived to have significant impact on the possibilities, perspectives, and character of intercultural communication. But I say that with two caveats, and they're very important caveats. The first one is this. All the data we collected is from self-reporting. Now, self-reporting has, as I said before, this distinct advantage that it can, unlike any other forms of data collection, provide access to participants' thoughts, motivations, emotions, and gratifications. However, the main disadvantage of self-reporting comes in the form of participants deceiving interviewers, either willingly or unwillingly also coming from interviewers asking what we call leading questions, a question that baits the interviewee to answer in a particular way. And even though you try to you know, get rid of as much of that as you can, there's no way you get rid of it altogether. Furthermore, self-reporting is based on the essential modernist assumption that subjects are transparent to themselves, that they know what they do, they know what they desire, and they can explain it to you. And you know, a couple hundred years of analysis of this shows us that's not always the case. Now I say all this not to undermine our study or to you know, undercut our results, but to caution us against making you know, gross generalizations or reading too much into the outcome. The data shows not that ICT has a positive effect on the study abroad experience, but that a majority of users report that they think it does. And I think that's an incredibly important distinction. That when you ask them, yes, they think it does. And that's crucial. 
The second caveat is that the generalizable data certainly provides support for the hypothesis, but it doesn't give us much more. And we would like to know much more, obviously. They do not, for instance, provide any deeper understanding as to why this is the case. It is the case, yes, OK, but why? How do we find out you know, further what is really motivating these students to respond in this way and what the rationale is? This is what we argue is the real crucial insight you can get from a qualitative kind of analysis, that you can get a data set that allows you to drill down beyond the generalizable data into more specific detailed responses that will give you insight into each individual indiv uh, interviewee's response. And so what we need to do next is really drill down into this data set and extract a lot of the information that is hidden in these individual responses. And that's what we're going to do with the remainder of uh, the presentations that you'll hear next uh, through all members of the team. So thank you, and we'll hold questions to the end, and we'll just keep moving on forward. Thanks. Thank